الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد بن عبد الله خاتم العنبيا والمرسلين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي عمري وحل الأقتدم من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته فسجزاكم الله خيرا for attending today um, so my name is Yusuf Patel and since 2008 I've been supporting parents with uh, what, what they called, before it was called SRE, Sex and Relationship Education, but now it's called RSE in schools. And so I support parents with issues that they're having in schools, but also the effects and the impact of the wider ideas upon the Muslim community and especially upon Muslim children. And I'll explain a bit about that later. But uh, um, just to say, uh, inshallah, we, we, I will give a presentation where I'll talk a bit about what's happening in schools, and then also uh, a bit more about um, what's happening in, in general society. How do we start to tackle these issues? I will ask you lots of questions, inshallah, and I hope you can um, participate in, in the responses, inshallah. Uh, I think uh, so. anybody who's watching online, you can uh, send in your questions, and anybody, any of the sisters, you've got paper, you can write down your questions, uh, and I'll take them at the end, inshallah. But first, I want to start off with just a bit of a quiz, just to find out what you already know. And I think this is the best way to try and understand what's happening in schools. So firstly, you know, the first question is, what is statutory? What is compulsory in a primary school? Is it just sex education classes? Is it relationship education classes? Or is it both? Anybody know the answer? What is statutory? For, if your child, first of all, are you, if you've got children in primary schools, put your hands up. Okay, so quite, quite a few of you have got children in primary schools. So what is statutory? What is compulsory in primary schools? Is it sex education classes? If it's sex education classes, put your hands up. If it's relationship education classes, put your hands up. And you have to answer one, yeah? And if it's both, put your hands up. Okay, so the answer is oh, relationship education classes. In primary schools, what they call sex education classes is not statutory. It's not compulsory. Yeah? And this is important for one reason that I'm going to go through next. What, in a primary school, what can you as a parent withdraw your children from? Take your children out of? Which sort of classes can you take your children out of? Can you take your children out of sex education classes? Put your hands up. Can you take your children out of relationship education classes? Put your hands up. And if it's both, put your hands up. So the answer is sex education classes. You have, in a primary school, the right to withdraw your children from these classes, the sex education classes. You can't withdraw from relationship education classes, but you can from sex education classes. Um, and it's really important that if you investigate what, you're te what they're teaching your children in, uh, in the primary school, yeah, and you're not happy with that, you can withdraw them. What's also important to understand is that although sex education classes are not compulsory in primary schools, most schools teach it. Yeah? So if you talk about this area, most schools in this area, most primary schools will be teaching it. It's really important that you ask your children's schools questions about this. Now the next question is, what is statutory in a secondary school? Who's got children in a secondary school? Put your hands up. Okay, so some of you come back. So what is statutory in a secondary school? Put your hands up if you think sex education classes are compulsory in primary schools. Put your hands up. Put your, sorry, in secondary schools, yeah. Uh, put your hands up if you think relationship education classes are compulsory in a secondary school. And put your hands up if you think both are compulsory in a secondary school. And the answer is both. The new subject, as from 2020, the new subject that's being taught in all secondary schools is called relationships and sex education. And so it's really important we know that this is statutory. That means all schools have to teach it. If your schools attend a community school, if your schools attend um, a, a faith school, or even if your children attend like a, an independent school, they all have to teach this subject. The next question is, what can you withdraw from? Can you withdraw from anything in a, pr in a secondary school? What can you withdraw from in a secondary school? So your relationship with sex education is compulsory, but what can you withdraw from? 
Can you withdraw from sex education classes? Put your hands up. Can you withdraw from relationship education classes? Put your hands up. And you've got to answer one. I, I, you can't just put your hands down for the, all three, yeah? Uh, and if it's both, put your hands up. Okay, so you, uh, nobody's answered that question, but you can withdraw your children from sex education classes even in a secondary school. And a lot of people don't know this, yeah? You can withdraw until your child turns 15 in a secondary school, yeah? After your child turns 15, the school will ask for your child, uh, they will ask your child whether they want to remain withdrawn or they want to uh, be uh, taught these classes in the final year of their secondary school. But from the age of 11 to 15, in a secondary school, you can withdraw your children from sex, education, from sex education element, from the element of sex education of RSE. Yeah? So it's really important that if you have children in primary schools or secondary schools, that you ask questions uh, about what's being taught. The next question is, does a school have to consult with parents? Yeah? Firstly, what does consultation mean? Can anybody define what the word consultation means? Asking first for permission. Is that it, or is there more than that? Yeah. Asking for your opinion. Okay, there is more. Yeah. So it's not just asking for permission, but there is because most schools will do that. That's the problem. Most schools just say, "We're going to do this. What do you think?" They won't really ask for your opinions, but the schools have to ask for your opinions. Yeah. They have to ask for your views about what they're planning to teach. Yeah. And so schools have to legally they have to consult with parents. But most schools don't do it properly. They do it as a textbook exercise. Oh, we've done it. We've, we've already consulted parents. That's enough. We've showed them what we're going to teach. So it's really important that we demand or we request or we expect schools to do more than just give, them, give us information. They have to ask for our views as well. Now, in terms of with consultation, what, what, uh, what, what, can, you, what can you influence a school about in, con in the consultation stage? When the school is asking for your views and your opinions, what, what, what can you um, uh, ask for a school to make changes about? Can you make changes, can you ask a school to make changes to the resources? Or which year group uh, the different topics are gonna be taught or both? So put your hands up if you think you can only, with, you can only uh, make changes with regards to the resources a school uses in, in, in primary school and secondary school. And put your hands up if you think it's just the year group that the different topics are going to be discussed. And, the, and, and put your hands up if it's both. And the answer is both. So in a, primary, in a primary school and a secondary school, schools have been given flexibility in two areas. In the resources a school uses, that means the books, that means the videos, that means the worksheets, schools have got the flexibility to decide on what resources to use. So if a school says, we have to teach this resource. That's not the truth. Because the school has a right to choose. And that choice, that the, the, the school could say, we're going to teach all of these things. Now, in the consultation process, if parents say, we don't like this particular part of your resources, and lots of parents say this, the school should make changes. Yeah? As well as that, in terms of the topics, there are different topics that a primary school and a secondary school have to teach. Now, with regards to this, the school doesn't have to teach this in year one or year two or year four or year seven, eight or nine or 10 or 11. Rather, it says that by the end of primary school, the school has to teach this. By the end of secondary school, a school has to teach this. So what's really important is that if you think a school is going to talk about different types of families yeah, in year two, and you think this is too early, you can say to a school, I want you to teach this in a later year group. I want to teach this in year, six, year five or year six because year one or year two is too early for my children to learn about different types of relationships in terms of different types of families, like uh, same-sex families, like two fathers, two mothers raising children. And so you can, as a parent, ask for these to be taught in a later group. Yeah? If a school is, for example, going to talk about the, the, different, the, the private parts of the body and lots of schools will start to teach this in year two or year three, you can say this is too early. I want this to be taught in year five or year six. Yeah? And if there's enough parents, the school should respond by making those changes. What's really important to note is that not all the views of parents are going to be taken into account. And you're not going to be able to tell the school to do one thing or another. The, the, rea the, the, the reality is 
the final decision rests with the school, but they have to consult parents in a meaningful way. What's really important, though, is that if you have children in school, you have to ask the school questions about these areas. Most schools don't hear from parents about these things. If a sc some schools will have a, a, an event for parents and maybe one or two parents will attend. And they say, we've already had it now. N parents aren't really concerned. And that will tell the school, parents aren't concerned. Let's just do what we want to do. So the way we show we are concerned is by asking questions and asking for changes to be made in regards to what they plan to teach your children. Now, what is the most effective power that parents have to challenge schools? Is it the law or is it collective parental actions? Parents coming together and raising concerns in a group. So if you think it's the law, put your hands up. If you think it's collective parental action, parents coming together, put your hands up. And no, number two, number two is the answer. The reality is the power of parents is in parents coming together in a group and raising concerns about what's going to be taught. Now, the reality is, is that when parents come together, schools, they, most schools listen because most schools don't want a bad relationship with parents. They want a good working relationship with parents. I'll give you an example. There's a school local to me. I live in Manor Park, and, in, in, and, and there's a school that is local to me that is a girls' school. 82% of those girls are Muslim girls. There were two teachers who, who identify as lesbian. They started a club called the Equalities Club. They, they hid it from parents, and they, almost, they created an environment where children were almost being forced to attend this club. Yeah? And they were just promoting, not equalities, they were pro promoting LGBT. Yeah? So they were, they were on, on a number of different levels, they were hiding the true face of this club. When we got the parents together, we brought parents together in a meeting, and then we got 70 parents to make a, a, a formal complaint. It was three days after the parents made that, those complaints, the head teacher wrote to all parents and said, I apologize, this was a mistake, we shouldn't have done this. We will abolish the club, we won't do this again, and we will be much more clearer with you about what we're teaching your children. So the, issue, the reality is that these things do work, but they, don't, they have to be almost followed up as well by parents asking questions over a period of time. So just one intervention by parents in a school is not enough. There has to be a number of ways in which parents um, interact with um, the school and demand more from schools than they're getting at the moment. Now, one of the problems is, is that we, in our community, we, are, we have a ticking time bomb, yeah? Our children are surrounded by so many influences. What sort of influences do you think our children are surrounded by? What are the influences as, pa as parents that you're concerned about? Social media, what else? They're, sorry? Okay, teachers, schools, what they've been taught in schools. What else? Peer pressure. Peer pressure, their children's friends, very powerful. Yeah, what else? Entertainment. Entertainment industry, what children watch on TV, in films. Yeah, Every, you know, nowadays, yeah, the whole environment ar about, around our children is promoting LGBT lifestyle. So you get a program or a film, and there may be five characters in that film or program. Yeah, one or two will be from the LGBT community. This almost gives the impression to our children that there are more people from that community than there actually are. Yeah? And it also normalizes those relationships within our children. Imagine this, look, the way TV programs and films have been, uh, have been uh, are, are written and are created, are designed and are, uh, are, 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 the way they are designed to create uh, a connection between the person and the character. So there may be a character in that TV program. Now, people connect with that character and they think, oh, I want the best for this character. I want, I want that person to succeed. I want that, per I want that person to, do, uh, to be successful in every aspect of life. When that character says, I, am, I identify as gay or I identify as lesbian, now that almost creates in our children's mind a confusion about, okay, how should I view this? On the one hand, maybe we, my, my, my parents or my family or my community don't accept this. 
But my favorite character in the TV program identifies that as that. So they are torn between two worlds. What do I believe? There's a real problem here. Yeah, there's a real problem here. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Children's cartoons, Disney, all of these, yeah, all of these uh, types of entertainment are pushing uh, zina and are pushing same-sex relationships. And it's normalizing this in the minds of Muslims. The number of Muslim children that are growing up, yeah, not even knowing or not even accepting that Islam has a very specific view about relationships. Yeah? It's, it, I speak to maktab, you know, the, the makatib, the madaris teachers, and they say whenever a child comes to me uh, after a class and we talk about LGBT, there's some children in the class, even there could be girls in the class who wear hijab, they will say, no, teacher, don't be homophobic. Don't say this about these people. These people have the right to live their life however they want to. One, one, uh, I got a call from one imam. And he said that um, in, in, his, in, in the school that his children, the children in his maktab attend, the children were asked yeah, to line up into two roles in the class. Yeah? Those people who agree with LGBTQ and those people who don't agree with LGBTQ relationships. All the Muslim children were on one side and all the other children were on the other side except one girl who wore hijab, wore headscarf. Now, when she, in the maktab, the, her teacher asked her, why, why is it that you stood up and you supported this? And she said, look, people have the right to live their lives however they want. And this is a problem. Yeah? This is not the Islamic criteria. This is not the Islamic principle when we look at human behavior. Yeah? The Islamic principle is what is good is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger define as good. And what is bad is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa define as bad. Yeah? But instead, the Western secular uh, criteria is everybody should live the life however they want to live. This is not our way of living our life. We submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so our children's mind and they're almost there, they're being brainwashed into accepting uh, these, these, these ideas. You know, over the past one and a half years, I've been receiving a lot more calls from parents, yeah? A lot more calls from parents who um, are saying, look, my, my son, I, this is Muslim families, my son identifies as gay. My daughter wants to be a boy. My daughter wants to leave Islam. This is becoming great, a greater and greater problem. And as a community, we need to look at how we solve this. One of our greatest problems as a community is that sometimes we wait for the crisis to happen and hit us before we start to respond. And this is not the best way to try and solve problems. Yeah? The best, like if, imagine if you're trying to stop a fire from happening in your home. The way to think about that is how, what is going to be, what are the different ways that a fire can happen in my home and let me try and stop that from happening in the first place. If a fire does happen, how should I respond? Where, which exit should I leave from? How do I leave, how do, how, do, how, do, how, do, how, do, how do I and the rest of my family leave this house safely? But if, for example, you say, I'm just going to wait till the fire happens and then I'll, I'll decide how to respond. This is not the way, this is, this is a, uh, dealing with a problem when the crisis hits us is not the way to solve the problem. And unfortunately in our community we are waiting for these problems to hit us and then we try and solve this problem. I got a call from a, a father just over a year ago. Yeah? He went to his local masjid, spoke to the imam and said, look, my, my son identifies as gay. He's 16 years old. Yeah? And so the imam said, okay, call, he called him. So he called me. And he said, what do I do? I met that boy maybe three or four times. Yeah? And he said, look, at the age of 13, I started to have these feelings. I never spoke to anybody about them. Yeah? And the small seed was planted in him. That seed grew and grew and grew. And then what happened was that he went to college. And in college, he met lots of people. And he said, look, I feel like I have attraction for other, to other boys. And they said, you are so brave. You are, ex you, are, this is, you are excellent, yeah? You are, uh, uh, you are coming out. You are so brave. You're, we're so proud of you. And they kept affirming and saying, excellent, yeah? After, after I met him, he said, look, um, this is who I am. 
and this is who I want to be. Nobody now can, can convince him otherwise. May Allah guide him, may Allah guide all of our children. But the reality is that as a community, sometimes we don't respond to these issues in a timely way, in a way that enables us to respond in a, in a proactive way. Now, I think there are four main problems that we have as a community. Yeah? And I'm going to talk through those very briefly. Yeah? One is foundational weakness in our children. A weakness at the, big, at the really foundations of what our children believe. We have emotional insecurity in our community. We have an acceptance in our, in our, in our, our children of, of, the, of the norms in society. Yeah? And we have, as a community, uh, a lack of responsiveness. Yeah? We have a responsiveness deficiency. We're not able to respond and know how to respond to this situation. The first question I want to ask you is, if I ask your children, why are you Muslim? So maybe I'll ask young people here, yeah? and ask the young people here, why are you Muslim? What would your answer be? Any of the young people here, why are you Muslim? Yeah, that's when I ask Muslims, young Muslims across the country when I go to different places, most children, 99% of children say, I'm Muslim because my parents are Muslim. Is there a problem with that response? Why? What is the problem? Why is there a problem with that response? Okay. So they haven't come to the conclusion, they haven't come to a conviction or a yaqeen in um, their life as a Muslim. They're just imitating their parents. Yeah? This, this leaves our children very weak. Yeah? We need to look at holistic solutions. That's what, today, I'm going to talk about LGBT, but that's one part of the solution that I believe we need to invest in as a community. Yeah? Fundamentally, yeah, you know, we live in what they call a post-truth society. We live in a society that no longer believes that truth is this, yeah, one thing. They believe truth is many things. Yeah? They believe that you have a truth, I have a truth, you have a truth, everybody has their own truth. But we believe Islam is the truth. Yeah? Islam is the truth. Yeah? It is the absolute truth from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? It's the truth that came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa over 1400 years ago. And it's a truth that stands the test of time. Yeah? Because it's based upon the human being's connection with their fitrah is based upon the understanding that Allah created us for a purpose and that the, that the divine revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Qur'an, is the miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide humanity. Yeah? The problem is, if our children do not have an independent personal connection or, 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 or um, conviction in Islam, Somebody comes to them and says, look, why are you believing in Allah? This God, this, we stopped believing in God 100 years ago, you know, 50 years ago. We don't believe in God anymore. We've got science. We've got technology. We've got, we're progressive. Why do you believe in this? The doubts start to form in their minds. But also, they say, look, why do you believe that marriage is the way in which men and women interact? Yeah? Why do you believe that men and women should marry? This is such an old-fashioned idea. Why can't you have a boyfriend or a girlfriend like most people in the society? Why do you have to wake up in the morning, early in the morning to pray to God? Why do you have to fast in Ramadan? Doubts come into their mind and they think, okay, why do I have to do this? Yeah? Because they can't connect the, the, the actions that they're being asked to do with the foundation. You know, when I, around the corner from my house, they were building a new, a new a, 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 a extension to a school. And every, like for about six or seven months, every day I drove past this building. Every day they were digging in the ground. Every day they were just digging and digging and digging. And I, and we was, I was speaking to my children and saying, look, when, when are they going to be, when are they going to actually get down to building this building? But they were still digging the foundations for such a long time. Why were they focusing so much on the foundations? Yeah, so the building is able to carry yeah, the, the number of stories that they want to build. If a storm were to come and there was, the foundations were not strong enough, what would happen to the building? It would collapse. Foundations are so strong in buildings, but foundations are even more important in human beings. 
Yeah, because foundations create the the, the basic um, building block of an idea of why am I here upon this earth? Who created me and for what purpose? Yeah, and so you know this idea that um, Allah subhanahu wa taala He in the Quran He asks human beings to contemplate to think about our existence. He He says to the people when when when, when the Quran came. First of all, in Meccan society to the Quraysh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked them, or were they created by nothing or were they the creators? Are you the, are you, were you created by nothing or are you the creators? Tell me, what is the truth of your existence? Do you believe that you came about by chance? You came about by nothing? Could we ever believe in anything that is created coming from nothing? No. The reality is everything that is created is a sign for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? We connect the things in the natural universe around us, even everything around us, and we, we, we relate it back to its origin. If you have five objects and you bring them and put them on the table, and you went back and say, where would this object come from? Oh, it may come from a factory, it came from the raw materials. At the end of that process, you're going to say, where did that come from? And that thing has to come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there's going to be a stop to ev the origin. The origin is stops at human beings taking something from the ground. But before that, who pl placed it in the ground in the first place? Who created not only the raw materials, but who created the capacity of human beings to use these raw materials to make things? You know, even if we were to study, in our, like for example, our children, if they're doing GCSE biology, for example, if they were to study the workings of the human heart, just that one study would, con would, would be an evidence for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The complexity of the human heart, the way it pumps blood around the body, the way it, in, it, it works, human beings could never create something like the human heart. Anything that they, they create would be a substandard, second rate to the actual creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What I'm saying to you here is that it's such an easy thing that we connect our children to questions about their existence. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does this in the Quran. In the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the alternation of night and day, these are signs for those who understand. The foundational weakness is when we don't connect our children to the reality of their existence and to the signs around them that prove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. Now, once, what is now, you know, how, how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala communicate with people? How has he communicated with our people and every other nation before us, every other people before us? Through the messengers, through the prophets and messengers. Yeah? And, and why, and how did people know that these prophets and messengers were prophets and messengers? What sort of signs? Sorry? Yeah, miracles, mainly miracles. But what was the miracle, the greatest miracle of the Messenger وسلم, that Allah subhanahu wa bestowed upon him? The Quran. Yeah. And the thing is, look, our children read the Quran. Yeah, they alhamdulillah, they read it, they memorize it, yeah. They 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 they, they do that as a natural course of their daily lives. But sometimes do we actually think, have they are they approaching the Quran? And say, this Qur'an is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes we take for granted that they know this. But have they connected what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guiding us with in his words in the Qur'an? Is, are they connecting that with the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the, is the one who is best placed to define for me how I should live my life? Yeah. And I think we need to make those connections much more clearer. How do we know that the Qur'an is the absolute word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What is the greatest proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents in the Qur'an about the fact that this Qur'an is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There's nothing like it. Yes. And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say to those people who claim that this is a fabricated book? At the time of the Quraysh, the Quraysh was saying this is... This is not from Allah, this is, this is from a Christian boy, or this is from the people of the book, or this is, this is, this is an imitation of, of what the scriptures of, of the Christian and the Jews brought. 
What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? If you believe this is fabricated, what does he ask the people to do? Sorry? Yes. He challenges them. He, there's a tahaddi, there's a challenge to bring the like of it. Firstly, ten surahs like it. And then when they were unable to fulfill that, just one surah like it. Yeah? This is a this is the proof that this Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? Now, once somebody believes that this Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything contained within the Quran yeah, is something to be followed. Yeah? So we trace back, we believe Allah exists. I believe Allah exists just as much as I believe this water bottle exists. Yeah? And even more so. I believe that the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just as much as I believe this word, this bottle exists. And even more so. And I believe then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines for me how I should live my life. No, no, so this is very brief. We need to connect our children to a foundation to strengthen their foundation. We live in a society which is called secular, where they don't, where people, the amount of people who are now living as, as, uh, as people who believe in a divine uh, deity, God, is very few. Yeah? Even those people who used to, like we're on the th- who used to believe in God, who used to say we're nominally Christians, they're, they're, they're reducing in number. Yeah? Every year the numbers are reducing of people who believe. Yeah? And this is across the Western world. This is happening. Our children are growing up in that environment. So they're going to be affected by that. Yeah? And we're already seeing some signs of that. But we have the truth. We have the truth from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That truth doesn't make us arrogant. But that truth makes us understand that most people are lost and they are in need of guidance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with the guidance of Islam. And so we should be so grateful for that. Yeah. And I'm going to talk a bit about this later, but it's about connecting our children to the strength of what we believe. Yeah. The next thing, I, first of all, I talk about foundational weakness. We've got to turn foundational weakness into foundational strength. And the second thing I talked about was emotional insecurity. Our children are growing up with a lack of uh, with emotional insecurity. And I'm going to introduce this topic by asking you one question. Put your hands up if you have children. Okay, most of you must have children. Okay, put your hands up if you love your children. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, good. Yeah, that's really good to see. Now, put your hands up again if your children know you love them. Now, how do your children know you love them? How do your children know you love them? If I were to ask any child here, does your father love you? And they say, yeah, my father loves me. But how do you know your father loves you? Yeah. Okay, he makes dua for you, alhamdulillah. What else? Sorry? A okay, child respects him. But is, is that love? Is that love in the... Is that, or is that just, um, I should respect my father? Yeah? But what, how, how, how do we show our children we love them? You hug them, you care for them, you kiss them, you tell them, yeah? You show your affection, good. You spend time with them, yeah? You give them some gifts sometimes, yeah? You do things for them. These are all signs of love. And the important thing, now, what is, when we were growing up, when, when I was younger, and I was, this was many years ago, too long ago, but when I was growing up, yeah, we used to, uh, how, how did we, how, how did our, what, did, what was the role of our fathers in our households? What was their main role? He was a provider, yeah. The breadwinner. He used to go out and work very hard, spend the whole day working, put food on the table, put uh, clothes on our back, pay for the, uh, the roof of our heads, and, uh, and really just provide for our family. Now, but children don't understand that as love. They just understand that's the father. That's what the father does. The way children understand love is by show, being shown that they are loved, by, by uh, uh, direct ways, yeah? in ways they don't have to interpret. Yeah? Your th- father does something for his son, the child doesn't have to think, what, does that, what, is it, what is my father trying to tell me? If the father says to a child, I love you, yeah? kisses a child, hugs a child, spends time with a child, quality time, yeah? 
uh, gives gifts to the child that the that that just out of nowhere, out of the blue, or just d does things for the child. This can show the child that they're loved. The reality, the reason why I say this is about emotional insecurity, is because love is the basic need of every child. Every child needs love. Yeah, a child who does not have the love of the father or who is unsure about whether my father, does my father love me or not, will grow up with insecurity, with vulnerability. That can lead a child to uh, relationships, really weak relationships with others. That could lead a child to zina, that could lead a child to same-sex relationships, that could lead a child to drugs, alcohol, just to find a way of filling the gap, filling the void of the lack of love of the father. Yeah? There was a, a psychologist in America yeah, called Joseph Nicolosi. He worked with hundreds of men in America who had same-sex attraction, who are attracted to the same sex. And he said that one of the major problems that he found in all of these men, yeah, he was trying to help them to overcome this issue. And he had the main, the, the similarity or the, the, the thing that, 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 that was consistent amongst all of these men was that they grew up with, with overly strict fathers who were not nurturing enough. So very, very strict fathers, but who did not show love to their children. Yeah? And so, he, so it's very important that we show love to our children in a way that they know we love them. And that's from fathers, not mothers. Mothers show love to their children, but fathers need to show that love yeah? in a visible way. Yeah? And I'm going to talk about examples of how we do that in the next uh, part. Um, but the really important thing is that your way of showing love to your children, yeah? maybe I work hard for my children, but your way of showing love your ch to your children is different from the way your children understand love. Yeah? Your ability as a father to influence your children is dependent on your relationship with your children. And the strongest relationship is built upon love. Yeah? If your children love you and you love your children, you can achieve a lot more with your children than if your children are not sure. And so the issue is that in our community, the love of the father is that missing uh, that missing jigsaw piece. Whenever I get calls from fathers especially who say, look, my son identifies as gay or my daughter wants to be a boy, yeah? one of the first questions, what are the, one of the first questions I ask that father? Yeah, what is your relationship with your son? Because this is an important aspect of this. Yeah? If you correct that part, you can correct other parts. Yeah? Uh, during the pandemic, I got a call from a father from a different country, a Muslim father who said, Look, my son in the pandemic identified as gay and I have, I, I've got, I'm really concerned. So I said to him, look, what is your relationship like with your son? And not to, not about, it's not about blame. It's not about saying, why did you do this? Why didn't you do this? It's about establishing that you can change the way you relate to your child if you make some changes around how you s invest in your relationship with your child. I said, what is, tell me about your relationship with your son. They said, look, over last, my son is 14 years old. Since he was young, I worked uh, in, uh, far away. I used to have to wake up in the morning when my children were asleep, and I came home at night when they were uh, still asleep. Yeah? Uh, so I, I was out for most of the day. So they, I didn't get to, uh, to, spend, to see them growing up, and I don't have much of a relationship with them, yeah? especially my oldest son, a 14-year-old. And the, that can be solved, that can be fixed. Any relationship can be, um, uh, can be, uh, can be strengthened. Yeah, it's, there's never too, it's never too late for that. Sometimes in our children, yeah, we, we, we give emotional love to our children as fathers when they're young, when they're one, two, three, four. As they get older, we try, we may, maybe think they're too old for it now. Yeah? When they're 11, 12, 13, 14, we say they don't need that love anymore, but they still need that. They still need it. <coughs> there are five ways of showing love to your children. One is physical touch, yeah? hugs, cuddles, kisses, and pats on the back. Yeah? There's an example from the Sunnah of the Messenger, from, the, from, the, from a hadith of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where he was kissing his grandson, and a man by the name of Al-Aqra, Al-Aqra uh, Al um, was sitting opposite him. Yeah? Uh, Al-Aqra ibn Habis al-Tamimi. They were sitting opposite Al-Aqra, and Al-Aqra saw the Messenger of Allah kissing his grandson and said, I have ten children, and I never kiss any of them. 
I never kissed any of them. He was almost like saying, this, I am a real man, yeah, because I've never kissed any of them. The Messenger of Allah replied to him, yurham. If you do not show mercy, you will not receive mercy. Yeah, it's, a, it's a rebuke. He's trying to say to him, look, this is not, you, 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 the, the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, so Allah is to show mercy to your children. And showing mercy is by kissing your children. The Messenger of Allah's children never were under any illusion that he didn't love them, even though he was so busy. He was so busy in carrying, carrying Islam to the whole of Meccan society. He was busy in so much. He was busy in teaching people. He was busy in guiding people, in answering people's questions. He was busy in every aspect of life. Yet his children knew that he loved them. They were under no illusion about that. So first is physical touch, kisses, hugs, uh, pats on the back. Second is affirming words, saying to your children, I love you. Yeah? Praising them, saying, well done, you did really well. Um, encouraging them, excellent, you're doing really well, keep going, keep your, you, you'll get there. Yeah? Now when you praise your children, yeah, it's really, and praise is a form of love. Praising your children is a way of conveying love to your children. Yeah? When you praise your children, you should focus on the results, so focus on the effort and not the results. There's two reasons for this. Why do you think that is? Focus on the effort that your children have put into something rather than the results that they've achieved. Sorry? Yes, the results are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not in their hands. That's one reason. Good. What else? Sorry? The ability? Okay, they might not be able to achieve the, the results, yeah, because but they put in the effort. And the effort can always be improved. Yeah? If they put in the effort, you reward them for the effort. Yeah? And the effort can always be improved and they, they can, it can be better, better, better. The result is the same. It, it, it ends. Yeah? So if they uh, maybe uh, learn one page of the Quran, yeah, maybe if next time they put more effort in, they can uh, get, um, achieve more. Yeah? If they're doing some um, helping out in the home, yeah, they put some effort into doing a task, they could put more effort in next time. But you, you praise them for the effort and you say, well done for that effort. Well done for looking after your brother and sister. Well done for, for helping me in, uh, uh, clean this room or whatever they've helped with. Yeah, absolutely. And if you want your children, if you want your children to, to, do, to, um, to embrace good actions, you focus on their good actions and you place the praise on those actions and say, well done for that. That was really good. Yeah, it was well done. Yeah. Now, that encourages them much more to do those actions. When you focus on a negative behavior, they will, they will not be encouraged uh, to, to do the positive behavior. So focus more on the things that they achieve and say, well done. And you'll find that they will do this more and more. Yeah. But well done, you know, after we all ate the dinner, you, you, you tidied up and you washed all the dishes. Well done, yeah? Next time they'll think, oh, I want to do this again, yeah? So focus on what you want them to achieve in terms of behavior and focus on that po positive things they do and recognize it, yeah? It's really important. A third way is quality time. Spending quality time with your children, away from mobile phones, away from all the distractions, just spending time with them, speaking to them, playing with them, um, uh, whatever they want to do that time, just spend time with them. And what's really important is one-to-one -one time with your children. If you've got many children, spending one-to-one -one time with your children is really important. We live in a society where everybody's busy. Is it, people, I hear people say all the time, I'm so busy, I've got no time. Yeah? So when you give your time to somebody, it shows that you value them, that you recognize them, you are uh, giving them something of importance. When we give our children time, yeah, away from all the distractions, you are showing to them that you love them. And then the first, the final two, these first three, the physical touch, the affirming words, and the quality time are the most important. But the last two are still important, but not as important. The first three are the foundations. The final two are gifts, giving gifts, and acts of service. So for example, you go somewhere uh, on a business trip or you go somewhere to visit relatives, you come back and you buy some small gifts for them. Not expensive. One or two pound gifts. It's not about the amount of money you spend on them. 
It's about what the gift conveys, the, the value you show, the, the love you show through the gift. Yeah? And so buying small things for them uh, that, that, that show you love them is an important way of building love with our children. Similarly, acts of service is the final one, the fifth way of showing love in a, in, in a direct way. And that's about doing things that your children want, want from you. Like, for example, you, uh, um, uh, you redec redecorate their room. You fix something for them. You make them a, a, a very imp a favorite meal, for example. And this is, these are ways in which fathers can show direct love to their children so that their children don't ever believe that my father doesn't love me. They know my father loves me because he tells me, because he shows me, because he spends time with me, because he gives me gifts, because he does things for me. So really, we need to send this message out far and wide. The lack of love of children, especially from the fathers, not knowing that my father loves me, leads children to do different things, vulnerable, make, makes them vulnerable, makes them try and seek love in different ways, yeah? from others, from relationships, from, um, from uh, drugs, from alcohol, from, all, every, from different types of things that fill the void of the lack of love from the father. So if we want our children to be strong, then we show love to them in ways that they know we love them. Now, the third thing I talked about was the societal norms. You know, the, the fact that we live in a society where different norms are being built around our children. And they are starting to accept these norms. Now, the question is, how do things in society become normalized? How do things become normalized? One, th one day that is not normal, and the next day that becomes normal. How do things become normalized? Sorry? Things become accepted in society by people, yeah. Things, people, things that were not accepted before become accepted. Sorry? The law could change, but that, that's not necessary for society to change. Law can change and change people, but also sometimes change happens before a law changes as well. That's good, yeah. What else? What, does, what is it about action, the actions of people that m changes norms in society? What does the action have to be? Sorry? Yeah. It has to be promoted. It has to be something that happens a lot in society. Not just if one person does something, that doesn't necessarily change a norm. But if lots of people do th the same thing, it can change a norm. It can change the way people see a particular behavior, a particular way of dressing, a particular way of doing something. Yeah? So when people see uh, other people, lots of people, when lots of people embrace a new idea or a new behavior, yeah, and they see it done consistently, that becomes normal. Like how many of you think, look, when you were growing up, yeah, and you used to do something in your house, yeah, you used to drink a particular drink or you used to make a particular food, and when you were younger, you thought everybody does that. That's everybody does the same thing as I do. And then you come across an example where you think, actually, not everybody does that. For example, you could, in your house, for example, you could, you could just drink uh, orange juice every morning for breakfast. The juice that you drink is orange juice. Now, if your child spends a night at your cousin's house or your sister's house or your brother's house and they uh, see that they wake up in the morning and they're expecting orange juice and they think, oh, there's, where's the orange juice? No, we don't drink orange juice, we only drink apple juice. And then they start to think, actually, I thought everybody drank orange juice because that, um, the norms in the household becomes your norm the norms that you think everybody follows. And then when you come across other norms, you realize actually not everybody follows the same norms as I do. But the reality is we live in a society and one of the important things we need to understand is that most people do what they do because most people do what they do. Most people imitate other people. If you ask somebody on Leighton High Road outside this masjid, you ask them, why do you dress like that? Why do you behave like that? Why do you do that? They'll probably say, because that's the way we all behave, or that's the way everybody acts. Because most of the time, people, they imitate other people's behaviors. Yeah? They imitate how other people act. And so it's really important that we recognize the influence that society has upon us and our children. Yeah? Somebody may start to drive on the road and, and drive very responsibly, and uh, let people go, give, people, give, give way to people, say, okay, you can go, or just drive in a very responsible way. Over time, everybody, people cut them off, people act in a very ne uh, uh, negative way towards them on the road. They start to adopt the behavior of everybody else. 
So they stop letting people go, they stop driving responsibly, and they behave like everybody else. It's very easy for people to be affected by other people. That's why the Messenger of Allah said that be, be, be careful who you choose as your close friends. You are upon the deen of your friends. Because the environment around us, especially the, our, our close company, affects our behavior, affects what we, what, we, what we do and don't do. And people around us and the environment around us is so um, powerful. And the reality is that most children just want to fit in. Yeah? If a child, with, with, is, we talked about peer pressure before, that if a child is with other children, yeah, and all the other children start to do something bad, for example, they start to steal, they say, let's go and steal something from that shop. Even a child who is good and behaves well and knows it's wrong, will, will, may end up starting to behave like those other children because they don't want to see, be seen as different. They want to be able to fit in. I'm the same as all my friends. I don't want to be seen as somebody who is different. In our society, there is a concerted effort to normalize yeah, LGBTQ relationships. As I said before, on TV programs, um, in, in every aspect of society, we have uh, these normalization messages. Yeah? You know, these, during the Qatar, Olympic, uh, Qatar World Cup, yeah, lots of these sports people came out and said, we need to support LGBTQ people, this is human rights, it's really important that we support this. If they had lived uh, and been in the World Cup uh, uh, ten year, uh, maybe 12 years ago, yeah, they would not have said this. Yeah? They would not have said this because these people are not acting um, because of their own choices. They're acting because of the environment around them and what the, how they're expected to behave. If you said to them, why should we support LGBTQ people? Tell me. They couldn't string a sentence together in response to that, answer, that question. They couldn't explain why. Yeah? But it's just because everybody's jumped on that bandwagon, they have jumped on that bandwagon. Everybody has accepted that people uh, can live their life however they want to, and everybody's accepted that without question. Yeah? What we've got to do is we've got to almost disrupt the normalization process. Yeah? We've got to disrupt the normalization process. One of the ways is we've got to ensure we speak to our children and in our community, we've got to speak and say, what is morally right and wrong is not what's legally right and wrong. Okay, legally, there's a, a particular standard. In society, a man can marry a man and a woman can marry a woman. That's legal. But what is moral? What is right and wrong according to people based upon their own worldview, their own view about life is different. So our moral perspective is different. And nobody should force anybody to accept anybody else's understanding of what is moral. Yeah? So we, don't believe, we believe that marriage between a man and a woman is the way that human beings uh, live and families are, 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 are created, are, are, are formed. Yeah? That's not how the most of society believe. Uh, that, that's not the type of relationship most, most of society believe. They believe that a man and a man, uh, men and women can behave in whatever way they want to. We say no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger of Allah de define for us how we live our, our lives. And so we've got to, uh, over the last maybe, uh, uh, recently I've seen that Muslims are, as, Muslim, as a community, we're more willing to discuss these issues than ever before. Yeah? And this is a good thing, yeah? because for a long time we stopped talking about these, maybe because we thought we'd get in trouble if we speak about them, maybe people will point fingers at us, maybe they will say, why are, you, why are you speaking like this? They'll call us homophobic, they'll call us bigoted, they'll call us transphobic, but there is a, a there is much greater degree of confidence in us speaking about our own views. Now we say, look, we live in a society of different people, People, we, we live together with different people. And if people want to live their life in a particular way, they can live their life in a particular way. But we don't have to accept every single choice or decision that anybody else makes. Yeah? They li you live your deen your way, you live your life your way, we will live our life our way. But the problem is, is when you start to impose your views upon our children in schools, in society and elsewhere, and you say, you, you, you believe that you have the right to indoctrinate our children about these issues. And that's what the problem is. Now, you know, speaking about these issues, what are your main challenges as, as, as parents to speak about these issues with your children, about sexual matters, about LGBT issues? What are your challenges?
Yes. Okay, how do, we, how do we safeguard our children? What else? Sorry? Yes. But what about the challenges? What are the challenges there? What are the uncertainties? What are the things that you think, I'm not sure how to do this? Yes. Okay. So what age do we discuss these issues? Yeah. Um, okay. Now, now, now I, I, would, I, would, I was going to show you this before. before actually, this one. Uh, any, does anybody know what this is? Yeah. What is this? Sorry? Say again? So, so, that, so that was the rainbow. So there's a rainbow flag. Yeah. That's the LGBT flag. Yeah. And then after that, there's an actual rainbow. Yeah. What's the difference between the two? Between the rainbow flag and an actual rainbow? Okay, alhamdulillah, that's a good answer. Yeah? Sorry? Okay, so the flag, but what else is different between the two? Yes? Yes. Yes. So they've taken a rainbow, which is a natural thing, and they've taken it as their flag. But the other difference between the actual LGBT flag and the rainbow, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created as a beautiful thing for the sight to behold, is, is the number of colors. In the rainbow flag, there are six colors. In the actual rainbow, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created as a beautiful sign of his existence, what, how many colors are there in the actual rainbow? Seven, yes. And so this is really important, yeah? Because we always talk about, look, they have taken over this flag. But the reality is there's a difference. So there's the, on the, on the right, there's the actual um, rainbow flag. And on the right, oh, sorry. Um, on, on, the, on, the, on the right here, the, on, on the left here, there's, the, there's a rainbow flag. And on the left, there is the, um, there is the, um, the actual flag and the the, the, the color indigo is missing in the rainbow flag in the LGBT flag so there's six colors in the rainbow flag and seven colors in the actual rainbow this is an example as some of you've said one is artificial and the other is natural the rainbow Allah created is a natural thing and the rainbow which is from the rainbow flag is is artificial yeah you know when when was the you know I'll ask you this question when was the the, the, the word homosexual, when was that created, that word, do you think? Anybody know? Sorry? No, much, uh, much later than that. Yeah. Oh, nearly, before, slightly earlier than that. It was in the Victorian times, yeah. But it was in the 1860s. Yeah, it was in the 1860s. And um, it was, it, it was a, a term that came about from this uh, man called Maria Kart Benny. He was um, in, living in uh, Germanic lands, in, in the Prussian lands, uh, in, the, in Europe, the lands that were, run, that were, that were controlled by uh, 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 the Prussian Empire. And he, he wrote a letter, and he said, look, we don't like the words that are used about us, that the words that are used about us people, people who, ha who are... Who, uh, who, are, who, are, who, believe, who have same-sex attraction, we, we, we are called sodomites, yeah? But we don't like this. We want to be called homosexual, yeah? Because that sounds better. He's also the person who came up with the word heterosexual, yeah? These two words that he came up with, homosexual and heterosexual. The issue is, is that, you know, he believed that the idea of who you are attracted to this is something which is a part of who a person is. It is like, just like someone has blood running through their body, yeah, as a natural part of who somebody is. He believed that who you are attracted to is also running through your veins. It's part of who you are, yeah. So he believed this can't be changed, yeah. So he believed that, that this, uh, this, is, this, is, this is so natural that you can't persecute us for, for being something that we are. 
You know, you always hear this idea, yeah? Don't, don't persecute us for being who we are. But the reality is, is that we believe that, this, that, that behavior is built upon desires, which is fully controllable. It's not a part of who somebody is, yeah? And so we, believe, we don't believe in this idea that behavior is almost in your genes, is part of who you are. But rather, it's controllable behavior, yeah? Now, the whole idea, we said, the whole idea of LGBT flag and LGBT identities, these are all made up. These are not real. These are made up. They say that somebody, a man who's attracted to another man is, is what they call gay. A woman who's attracted to another woman is called a lesbian. Now, these are all made up terms. They don't have any reality to them. They're just labels that people use that make a behavior or a desire into an identity. And this is the problem. We need to really speak about this in these terms to our children. That, these, the idea, that every behavior that somebody can either act upon or not act upon, first of all, it's controllable. But these behaviors don't force you to do something or not do something. So if somebody has a desire to steal, now nobody can say, look, I had a desire to steal and that made me steal. No, you chose to steal. You chose to act upon that desire. Similarly, if somebody has an attraction for somebody else and acts upon it, they are acting upon their desire in a controllable way. They've, 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 they've made a choice to behave in a particular way. Nobody is forcing them, no, no, nothing forces them to act in one way or another. So desires are external part of who's, they're external to somebody. They're not internal to somebody, yeah? Uh, the reality is that desire is controllable. You, you are, desire propels you to action, but you choose to behave or not to behave. Yeah? Um, and, and what they also believe, and this is an idea that is really corrupted, they believe that your attraction, someone's attraction, is, 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 is attraction from birth. Somebody who, if somebody has an attraction to somebody else, that attraction, somebody that a man is attracted to another man, a woman is attracted to another woman, that comes from birth. Yeah, but we believe that uh, sexual attraction is not something that a child has. It's something that happens that grows when when somebody goes through puberty. That's when attraction starts to occur, and so their idea of all of this is so corrupted. We also need to make in our children's minds. A clear distinction between two things, yeah, love and lust. Love is different from lust. Lust is sexual attraction, and they, when 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 the LGBT community speak about love, they don't they don't mean love. They mean lust, yeah, which is just the attraction and acting upon desires as an as an as you want. But love is different. Love is what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created uh, between. A, 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 a parent and their child, between a child and their parent, between a, a, a brother and his sister, between a sister and their brother, between a Muslim and another Muslim, between two people who, um, who, 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 uh, who are connected together and love each other for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, this idea, we need to reclaim the word love from the sexualization of this term. Yeah? You know, this idea that a, a man can love a man and a woman can love a woman is absolutely acceptable. If you love your brother, tell him, the Messenger of Allah told us. Yeah? This idea of love is something so, um, so pure, but they have made it so corrupted. And so when we speak about love, we speak about love in that way. For example, a boy, a boy is growing up and he starts to feel like very strong attraction to another boy. They start to put a label on this boy and say, oh, that must mean you must be gay. Yeah? And so the desire that is controllable becomes something permanent because the label is placed upon him and he's placed in a box and that's what he is. This is who you are. You have to live your life like that. We don't accept this idea of behavior. We accept, we believe behavior is controllable and also the idea that all of these, these identities are built upon feelings. Now, if you're going to talk to somebody about feelings, what are feelings? Are feelings permanent or are they temporary? They're temporary. Feelings come and they go. Yeah, somebody ha is angry, they're not going to be angry forever. That feeling goes. Somebody is attracted, somebody sees somebody and is attracted to somebody. Now, that feeling can pass, but the more you concentrate and focus upon that feeling, and the more you give life to that feeling, the more permanent 
that feeling becomes. Yeah? And so it's really important that we teach our children that feelings do not, do not make life-changing decisions based upon feelings. A boy is growing up, or a girl is growing up, and then they say, I feel different. I feel like I'm in the wrong body. They say, oh, you must, you're a boy, but you must be a girl. Oh, you're a girl, you must be a boy. And this really takes a feeling that will pass over time, and it makes it a permanent thing. So that boy now, all he wants to do is become a girl. That girl, all she wants to do now is become a boy. And this is, this is, the lives are being ruined in this way. And this idea of there being a reality to a, the existence of a male and female is being questioned. Men and women don't exist. We live in a society at the moment when people are asked the question, what is a woman? They can't answer this question. There was a man who was going around on YouTube. He's a YouTuber. He went around London and he asked different people, what is a woman? And the people were answering, I'm not sure. It's a difficult question. I don't know the answer to this. Subhanallah. This is the most simple question you could ever be asked. But the society, because the more society is removed from divine guidance, the more society is unable to answer the most simple of questions around what Allah subhanahu wa has created that, 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 is, that is about the truth of, of, of the states of male and female. The, the more we are disconnected from divine guidance, the more we, ex we, we find these di answers difficult to answer. Um, you know, in, in, in America, there are people called transracial people. Yeah, have you heard of these people? They are white people who think they should have been born in a black family, and there are black people who believe they should have been born in a white family. Yeah? And I said, look, I was born in the wrong family. I was born in the wrong body. And people laugh at them and say, ah, oh, this is not real. Why is that not real? But why is a man wanting to become a woman real? Or a woman wanting to become a man real? There are people in America and in other parts of Europe that are called transable people. They believe they should have been born disabled. They are able-bodied. They've got two arms and two legs. But they think that we should have been born with one arm or one leg, or I should have been born blind. They actually go to the doctors and say, cut off my leg, I don't feel it. I think I should be born disabled. Or they, they don't have any problems with their legs, but they're still in a wheelchair. They, they put themselves in a wheelchair, and they're in the wheelchair all day. Yeah? They, they can walk fine. Yeah? And people say, this is wrong. You are appropriating uh, the rights of disabled people. But why is that wrong? If you can identify as anything, why can't you identify as anything then? If you identify as a tree, what's wrong with that? Either there's consistency and you can identify as anything, or you should only or identity doesn't really have any real meaning. Yeah? The issue is there's such an cons inconsistency about this whole idea of what identity is, because identity is not real. It's a made-up phenomenon. Yeah? You, 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 you be whatever you feel. And we don't believe that. Feelings don't have the capacity to become truths. Feelings are temporary. Feelings pass. And that's another thing. They, they will say, and they, like for example, in primary schools, they will have, there's a, there's a module that they use in this, there's a teaching resource called Jigsaw PSHE. And in, uh, 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 lots of parents have come to me with this issue that in like in uh, when children are seven or eight years old, they go through this module. And it, first of all, it talks about uh, it talks about gender stereotypes. So it says that a boy may not like the color blue, or football, or a girl may not like the color pink, or dolls and dresses. Now this is they said this is gender stereotypes. This is not real. A boy doesn't have to like blue or football, and a girl doesn't have to like pink or dolls and dresses. Um, and then they carry on and they say that they talk about transgender people. <coughs> and then they say that if you do not feel like, uh, like, uh, like a boy, you could be a girl. And if you don't feel like a girl, you could be a boy, which is completely ludicrous. In nurseries now, yeah, they, there's ex examples of children yeah, who are encouraged, boys who are encouraged to dress in girls' clothes in the dress-up time. They actually act, not as if you can choose it, they're actively encouraged to dress like girls or boys who are encouraged, uh, girls who are uh, encouraged to dress like boys. You know, this is corrupting young children. Yeah? And schools which are meant to be places which 
educate our children are becoming places which are endangering our children. And so we've got to keep an eye on what's being taught. And we've got to, the issue is we've got to have conversations with our children about these issues much earlier than we would like. Yeah? Because the reality is our children are going to come across these ideas much earlier now in schools and in society. Yeah? Um, and it's really important that we, 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 we speak to our children about this and say, even this idea that there's, such a dif there's a difference between males and females. Now, if you t said this 10 years ago, this would not be controversial, but now it's controversial. Yeah? There are a thousand differences between male and female. Yeah? Like, um, for example, they've done research, and they said that if there was a... If there, imagine there's a smell in this room. Yeah? There's a smell. The smell isn't so... Um, uh, it's not, it's not, it's the smell isn't so great that everybody can smell it. But if a man and woman walked into here and smelt it, the women, women have a greater sense of smell than men. And so a woman is more likely to smell it than ma men do. Me women have the more, uh, are more likely to be able to d distinguish between different shades of color, between, between, between the colors. Yeah? Um, in schools, they say that boys, yeah, boys have their hearing, their sense of hearing is less sensitive than, than girls. So what used to happen is that girls, boys used to sit at the back of the class. If the teacher had a very soft voice, the boys couldn't hear. And so boys would just start uh, uh, misbehaving. And they were seen as problem children. And then when they realized, actually, it's the boy can't hear. So they put the boys in the front, and then that solved the problem. Girls, uh, when they have a problem in the class, when they are, can't do any work, they can't do the work that they're set, they tend to ask, uh, to ask for help straight away. Boys ask for help as a last resort. Yeah? If you were to find the bones of somebody who died a thousand years ago and looked at these bones, you could know whether this was a man or a woman. Yeah? The reality is the difference between male and female are at the level of the chromosomes, are deep within the body. They are, they are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta has created in code in the body. Yeah? The reality is there are differences between male and female. We've got to fight. For, just to even say this sometimes will be controversial from, by many people. They will say that you can't say this. Yeah, you can't say it. You know, in Scotland, they passed a law which said that, that people now can start to identify. A man can identify as a woman. Before, you have to go to the doctor and you have to get evidence that you, 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 you actually feel like you're in the wrong body. But now they've changed the law and they've said that, no, you don't even have to go to the doctor. You can identify, self-identify. You just say, I'm a woman and you're a woman. You just say, you're a man and you're a man. The Cambridge English Dictionary yeah, changed the definition of a woman. It said that the woman is an adult female and anyone who identifies as a woman. Subhanallah. This, and, and, and they want to even change the law in England to... This, the same as Scotland now. There was, people are calling for this, a change in the law. Now, we have to talk to our children about these simple things that we th took for granted many years ago. Because the reality is, our children will be told, male and female doesn't exist. You can be whoever you want to be. But at the heart of all of these discussions, we have to talk to our children about who is the best, who is in the best position to define for human beings how we should live our lives? Is it the imperfect creation who will change their minds every other day and who is basing their, their, their understanding of making those changes on flimsy ideas? Or is it Allah subhanahu wa the perfect creator who defined for us what is good and bad? And, and that's really it. All I wanted to discuss with you is, is this idea that we need to, as a community, start to discuss these issues with our children. We need to create that strength, that conviction in Islam in our children. We need to ensure that as a community, fathers show love to their children in the most direct ways. Yeah? And we need to uh, dis discuss these issues with our children around LGBT issues. Yeah? That people who, who behave, people who believe in lots of different things, we don't believe in these things. Yeah? We believe in Allah subhanahu wa defining for us how to live our lives. We believe in marriage between a man and a woman. We believe there's a difference between a male and a female. We believe that desires are not things which make us do an action. That we will be accountable in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for how we responded to our desires. Whether we responded to our desires in a way which pleases Allah by not doing it. Or in a way which displeases Allah if we did it. But we also 
As a final thing, is teach our children about the importance of one thing. Yeah? When somebody commits a sin, what is the first thing we ask them to do? Toba. Yeah, absolutely. Toba is such an important um, idea in Islam. Yeah? It cuts through the normalization of sin. Yeah? It cuts through the normalization of sin. Because when somebody does a sin and does Toba straight away, they recognize that that action is a sin. They also regret doing that sin and they promise Allah, they pledge to Allah, I will not do it again. Yeah? The, lots of people, they do a sin and instead of doing Toba, they, they say, at least I'm not doing that sin. Yeah? At least I'm not doing that. Oh, I'm, I, I'm, I may identify, um, some Muslims who I, say, I may identify as LGBT, but at least I don't hurt anybody. At least I don't um, um, take drugs. At least I don't deal with drugs. At least I don't take alcohol, whatever. As soon as you do the sin, shaitan will tell you, don't, you're, at least it's not that bad. It's small. It's okay. And he'll try to prevent you from doing toba. And toba, when it cuts through the normalization of sin, when you don't do toba and you do the sin, and you do the sin again and again and again without doing toba, in the end, you will accept that action as being acceptable, as being fine as not being a crime against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We've got to teach our children, any sin we commit, small or big, make tawbah straight away. Because it's not about the, 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 the greatness or smallness of a sin. It's about who we, are, who we are transgressing, who we are disobeying when we do that sin. Yeah? So tawbah is a hugely important process that we need to teach our children as an act when they do a sin. Yeah? You know, what we want to do is, as a community, we want to help the community. We want to... We want to, we're trying to create different resources for parents. One thing we're investing in is we're going to create um, an animated series yeah, that will cover LGBT that is aimed at 7 to 11 year olds. Because this is the age group in which these indoctrination is happening in schools and in society for our children. We want to create a cartoon that's fun, entertaining, that's engaging, and that also educates our children about our values around LGBT issues. We've also created a maktab curriculum that we want, to support, we want to roll out in the community that gives holistic solutions to all of these problems. We believe maktabs are hugely important in creating safe spaces for Muslim children to raise their concerns when they're, uh, when they're taught these things in schools or in society. We also want to, we're, gonna, we're trying to uh, train an, a, a, a team of 100 people across the country who will be able to help us support the community to meet the challenge, the LGBT challenge and the RSE challenge in schools and in, and in society. So this is, this is what we're going to do now. If you've got any questions, please uh, raise your hands. If you've got any comments or any suggestions, um, I'm not sure how long we have left. Uh, but if there's any questions um, if, from anybody online, you can uh, uh, submit your questions. And if also, if there's any questions from the sisters, please do write down your questions and they'll be collected, inshallah ta'ala. You know what? There's two things here. One thing is we need to challenge this in schools. Yeah, like you know what they do in schools is they say that we are teaching to teach children tolerance. We are teaching them equality and accepting people. The reality is, is that they are enforcing their values upon our children and we should push back and say, no, by teaching people tolerance, you say you treat everybody well. And that's fine, we can do that. We treat everybody who we meet well. We don't mistreat people, we don't attack people, we don't uh, uh, insult people, we just treat people as human beings. But by you imposing those values upon our children, you are doing more than just calling for um, uh, treating people well, you are calling for our children to change their faith views about LGBT relationships. And you should say, look, the reality is that there are equalities in, this, in the law is defined by nine characteristics. One of those characteristics is faith and belief. So we have the right to hold our views about these issues. So that's one thing, push back in schools. But a second thing is what we've got to do is ensure we have these conversations with our children. Yeah? The reality is sometimes... Our children grow up, and because nobody presents to them an alternative view about these issues, they accept the norms in society. 
So we've got to present alternative views to our children during Pride Month and LGBTQ History Month. We've got to discuss this with our children. Have you, oh, you saw that flag. What, what does that flag mean? Oh, yeah, it's an LGBT flag. What, do, what have you learned about LGBT in school? Yeah, you have a conversation with them and say, look, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about these relationships, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished, punished a, a people who engaged in these acts, um, uh, it, it, the, the, the people of Lut. And the people uh, uh, and the Prophet Lut alayhi he he, uh, he, um, yeah, he, um, he uh, struggled against these people and he uh, tried to guide them to uh, to live as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended. So I think it's just, all it is is really having those simple conversations with our children. Sometimes having those conversations much sooner than we would like, but the reality is we can't afford to wait for these conversations sometimes because of the nature of the attack in entertainment industry, in schools, through our children's friends and in society. Uh, there's a question, an online question. How can parents navigate the conversation on how the sub this subject is normalized and taught in schools? Any tips for parents? I think any tips for parents, but I think the, the key point is, is what I just mentioned now, is have, the conversa have conversations. Have regular conversations with our children, which, just, um, which, which are not lectures, which are not one monologues, which are dialogues. You just have natural conversations with your children about these issues, yeah, and speak to them about things that we believe in and things that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is uh, is uh, forbids in terms of uh, our, our our behavior. I think the, the yeah the point is is that uh, one of the things that we should implement is something called teachable teachable moments. Yeah, that means that you use things that happen around our children as prompts for conversations around those things. So our children see a rainbow flag, or they see two people acting in a particular way in society, and you you know that they've seen that. So you say, well, what do you think about that? So you start off a conversation, and then you engage them in that conversation and say, why, why is that wrong? Yeah? And a lot of the times we should focus on, on asking them questions and getting them to think critically, rather than just giving them the answers. Say, what do you think about that? Why is it wrong? Why does Allah subhanahu forbid that? Why is why is uh, what why why do you think that that you you, are, you we are, we have a marriage? My, your mama, mother and father are married. We live in a family in our in our home. Why is this the best way for people to live? And you start to build those those uh, values. Also, you role model strong a strong Muslim family in the home. The reality is, in this turbulent society, the for for us as a community. The family is going to be the strength for everything in our community. Yeah? Having a strong family is so important. We need to invest in strong Muslim families. Strong Muslim families that live by Islam in the home. Yeah? Where, where, where the father and the mother, they, 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 um, they model the behavior of what a strong Muslim loving family is. Yeah? Including the family which, which worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which strives for the higher values than the consumerist values in society or the values of liberal, secular liberalism in society. You know, we, we, we live the values that we want our children to live. Um, I think that's really, really important. Yes, brother. Well, uh, uh, Islamic schools deal with these issues in very different ways. I'm not aware about what they exactly teach, but uh, the reality is, is that obviously uh, uh, they would be al they will al be allowed to speak about these issues from their faith perspective. Yeah, so they will be allowed to speak to the children and say same-sex relationships are haram in Islam. They're not allowed. They can talk about kamilut. They can talk about things in a much more uh, broader way to put things into effect. Um, but I think really it's important to ask the school how do they teach it. Yeah, it could be, but also. It's really important to ask questions, yeah, not take it for granted, yeah. Um, to say, how are you teaching this to my children? Uh, it's really important that you just ask these questions. And there's some online questions here as well. Um, uh, I ask, as a secondary school teacher and as a parent, how would you respond to someone who argues against the clear distinction between men and women with the case of intersex hermaphroditism? Um, uh, you know, the issue is, is that. You know, the number of cases in which what they call intersex. Intersex is when a child, a baby is born, yeah, with either uh, uh, indeterminate uh, uh, sexual parts, or so, so you won't, you, so they may not be uh, 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 visibly male or female. 
Now, this, this situation is an exception. This happens in 0.01% of the population. This is such a small minority of cases. Yeah? The reality is, is that this whole idea of transgender is not built upon any, any uh, biological differences. Yeah? That a child is born um, with, uh, with indeterminate, uh, gen indeterminate uh, genitals. Yeah? It's based upon a feeling. Yeah? It's based upon... I, today I wake up, I, I feel like a woman. I'm going to be a woman. I feel like a man. I'm, I'm going to be a man. I feel like a tree. I'm going to be a tree. Yeah? It's based upon a feeling. And that's the problem. That there's a real problem with this idea that you can just change your identity, what they call your identity, based upon uh, a feeling. But I think what we've got to do is just have these conversations with our children about the, the fact that there are so many differences between male and females. Yeah? Yeah? You know, one, one thing that they, they when they did, did the research about the differences between male and females, they, if, you, if, you, if a woman comes to a man and says, a wife comes to the husband and says, Look, I really had a bad day. You know, the children were so naughty today. They, they, they made me so angry. Yeah? Now, the, usually, most women, they complain about these things in order to get sympathy or to get, oh, I'm sorry you faced that. Um, it was really bad. Um, you, uh, you, they want encouragement. They want sympathy. They want someone just to listen. But men, when they hear problems, they give solutions. So they say, oh, maybe next time you should do this, or you should do the, get them to do this activity, or, uh, you know, if they misbehave, do that. Now, women don't want solutions in these situations. They just want to be listened to, yeah? There's a huge difference between male and females in this. Now, if, if, uh, maybe we could even write something which, which outlines the, so, the, how many differences there are between male and females, yeah? Because, as I said, this is something so... There's such a difference between male and females, but it's become an idea of controversy in society where they say, no, um, men and women are the same. And that's, that's a problem, yeah? Men and women are different, yeah? And, and, and that, that, that's a reality. Um, uh, so I think, yeah, I think just argue it from the perspective of the research. And maybe we could publish something that can, that can uh, provide support around this. But as I said, intersex and hermaphroditism is such a small minority of cases. Um, and it's, it's and that's a real thing, yeah. But most cases, people just base their want to be a man or woman based upon feelings. Yes, brother. So we're going to create some resources. One thing, we, we, there's a few things we're going to create. One, we're going to create articles on this for parents, video presentations for parents. Also, we, we've asked parents to provide like, lots of questions that children ask. Yeah, so 100 top questions that children ask. And we're going to provide like, answers, bullet-pointed answers, short summary answers for this. Um, so we, this all hasn't been developed yet, but um, uh, we, we, once, it's, once it's all developed, we'll, we'll release them um, out to the public. Things like the cartoon series, we're planning to have the first episode released in February for that, inshallah. Um, the Maktab curriculum is going to be launched, in, inshallah, in, in, uh, in January, February. Um, so there's lots of resources that we're going to send out there, inshallah. Um, so just keep an eye out. Our website is sreislamic.org. Um, so you can just uh, uh, go onto that website um, and, and, and the updates will be there, inshallah. Um, and then we'll just find ways of getting these resources out to support parents, inshallah. Yes, brother. Absolutely. So yeah, Sheikh said that uh, about the there's no there's no doubt in the Quran because there's there's no there's no contradiction in the Quran, and this is really important. You know, it's there's so many examples which illustrate the truth of the Quran. Now look at this idea. You know, simple idea. You know, the Prophet said in uh, Surah Lahab that Abu Jahl, uh, uh, no, Abu Lahab, Abu Lahab will be in the hellfire with his wife. Yeah. Now if Abu Abu Lahab uh, wanted to um, disprove the Quran, he could have said the shahada, isn't it? He could say, I'm Muslim, and that would disprove the Quran. He didn't, because 
it was a truth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew he would die upon uh, non-Islam. He would not die upon Islam. Yeah? There's so many examples. There was like, you know, when the, um, uh, when the, um, when the, the, the people came uh, to the Quraysh, the Mushrikeen came to the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi and asked him about uh, uh, questions about the, the people of the cave, the uh, Ashab al Kahf, the people of the cave, and how many people were there? Was there a dog? They had all these questions because the Jews had said, Ask this question to Prophet. And the Prophet, they came to Prophet and asked him about these questions about the people of the cave. And he said, I will give you the answer tomorrow. And the, the, the revelation didn't come for weeks because Allah subhanahu wa said, if you, were, if you say to the people uh, that of something you're going to do in the future, say inshallah, isn't it? Which proved that this, 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 this revelation did not come from the Messenger of Allah. It came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who decides when the revelation comes and doesn't come. There's so many examples. We can maybe even list all of these examples just so that we can have these conversations with our children about how we alhamdulillah, have this, this, this great revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we should be grateful for. And the, 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 the way we should be grateful for is by living our lives by the Quran and obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. 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 That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. If mankind and jinn were to come together and try to bring the like of this recital, this Quran, they would never be able to do so. Absolutely. You're right. Yeah. Okay. That's it. We'll finish now, inshallah. If you ever have any questions, you can, my email address is yusuf at sreislamic.org. You can always ask me any questions, inshallah. Yusuf, Y-U-S-U-F, at sre islamic.org and then inshallah ta'ala we will answer them yes yes absolutely jazakallah khair jazakallah khair yes no absolutely absolutely jazakallah khair for attending today inshallah assalamu alaikum Bar, ik ben